Hey there, my name is Justin. I'm one of the pastors at Hope City. I'm really glad you're checking out this week's message. I hope you'll take a minute, look around our website, visit our YouTube channel, and download the Hope City app by searching Hope City Indy in the App Store or Google Play Store. There's great content on the app that goes far beyond weekend services. Hope City is a place where you can belong before you believe. No matter where you come from today spiritually, I hope this message helps you find hope and move closer to Jesus. Enjoy the message. How we doing? Everybody good? Last Sunday before Christmas, I'm psyched, I'm pumped, I'm ready to go. Uh, for the first time in 26 years of marriage, I think all of our Christmas shopping is done. And uh, somebody call like Guinness World Records. So that's like, that's, 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 that's some, we're going through a midlife crisis, that's all I'm saying, because that's never happened in the history of our marriage, but I think we're good to go. Uh, my name is Justin, one of the pastors here. And if you are a guest with us today, Super glad, glad that you're here, and one of the things that we say all the time is that Hope City is a place where you can belong before you believe, and so no matter where you are in your relationship with God today, uh, you're welcome here, and we're excited that you are here. We are uh, in this series called Wonder, and we're talking about rediscovering the wonder of Christmas, and before we dive into the message, I want to give you just a few things uh, over and above the announcements that we just heard that are really critical for the next five days, all right, and really the next couple of weeks. Um, Christmas Eve starts this Thursday. We're going to do a uh, 6.30 service on Thursday night, which is the 23rd. And so if you're going to be gone on Christmas Eve, you know, the actual Christmas Eve day, uh, this is a great opportunity for you to come. There's going to be fire pits, all right? It's enough said, right? Why, why not come? All right, there'll be fire pits. There's going to be a hot cocoa bar. There's going to be all kinds of fun uh, stuff. We have a video that we've been working on with a bunch of uh, Hope City kids. That's going to be kind of the highlight of the service. It's just going to be a great time to invite a friend. And so here's the deal. I want you to, as you leave today, you're going to be given one of these cards, all right? Do not throw it in the parking lot, all right? Just throw it away when you get home if you're not going to invite somebody. But invite somebody. We have a thing called attend one and serve one. And so invite somebody to join you because people are more inclined to come to church at Christmas time than any other time of the year, all right? It's an easy invite. It's easy, hey, coworker, hey, neighbor, come and be with me on Christmas Eve, all right? So make sure you pray about that and be strategic about that this week. And after the service today, there are sign-up sheets back by the Hope City uh, Church sign back there in the back. Uh, we are short. We need some help on the actual 530 service of the 24th. We have, we have holes in all services, but the 530 service of the 24th, if you can attend on Thursday night and serve on Friday night, or if you can attend the 4 o'clock and serve at the 530, that would be super helpful. I'm going to be back there, all right? So you're going to have to walk past me like this, all right? Uh, so uh, just, you know, if, you, if you're available, we could use your help to make this Christmas Eve the best experience possible, both in person and online uh, for our friends, all right? So uh, if you can serve, that would be phenomenal. And this is our last Sunday morning service of 2021, all right? Uh, next, the, tw the day after Christmas, we're not here, all right? If you come, we're not going to be here, all right? I'm going to be sleeping in. That's what I'm going to be doing on uh, the 26th. And so I'm excited to share this Sunday with you, and then we'll jump back into regular services in 2022. Um, finally, I want to speak a little bit about our Give Hope offering, I'll give you a little bit of an update. As of yesterday, I don't know what the number is today, but as of yesterday, a real-time update. Our goal is $100,000, all right? And uh, we're going to have that, that divided up in a number of different ways. Uh, but we have had a little over $27,000 given, uh, which is ahead of pace where we were last year. Some of you are like, well, that's only like one for the... That's ahead of pace where we were, all right? And we're talking... This is the actual turning point. So we have two Sundays left of December, including today. And, uh, and so I feel really good about that. Um, 28% of our budget last year, 28% of our budget. Imagine if 28% of your income was given in one month. That was our reality last year. So December is a huge month for us. And so if you're contemplating what you're going to give, if you're praying about what you're going to give to Give Hope, um, Micah, who spoke last week, is our oldest son. He's on staff at Northview Church. It's a small little church here in Carmel, and, uh, in case you haven't heard of it. And, uh, and Pastor Steve Poe says this all the time, and I love it. He says, you're never closer to God than when you give. You're never closer to God when you give. That's what Christmas is all about. God giving, right? Like God loved you so much that he gave his son, right? And so our gift back to God, it shouldn't be obligation. It shouldn't be guilt. It shouldn't even be need. It should be a response 
to what God has done for us. And so, how can you give? I want to make you aware of a couple of ways, that one of which you may not even be aware of. You can give stocks directly to Hope City. Uh, you can have your broker uh, contact our broker, your people contact our people, and you can transfer stock. And the stock market's been good to some of you over the last year and a half, all right? And here's the deal. We get the full cash value of that stock, and you get a full tax deduction from that stock, all right? And so it's a win for us. It might not be a win for your portfolio, but it, it's, it will be eventually. It'll be a win for the kingdom of God, all right? And you can do that. Uh, it's super easy. And uh, if you want to contact uh, me or the church, uh, I can give you a little bit more instruction on that. Um, but that's just a, a way that you can be generous in a creative way. Another way is obviously traditional cash giving check on our app, on the website. And here's what's so unprecedented about this year. The CARES Act of 2021, because of COVID, has changed the tax law for this specific year. It expires December 31st. I'm not a tax expert, all right? So if you're a CPA, you can check me at the door. But here's what I understand about the CARES Act of 2021 unprecedented into this year, you can actually deduct up to 100% of your adjusted gross income this year. And so if you gave stock or if you gave a large gift in past years, typically only a portion of that, up to a certain amount of that could be deducted. This year, and it expires December 31st, you can actually deduct up to 100% of your adjust, adjusted gross income for this tax year. And so don't write on your 1040, my pastor told me so, check with your tax person on that, all right? to make sure that I'm right, but that, that's how I understand why this year is a great year of giving and a great year of opportunity for us. Now, because of your generosity and because some of, some of you have already given to Give Hope uh, and we have accumulated $27,000, we said from the very beginning we're taking $10,000 right off the top, regardless of what else we get in, all right? And we're giving it to Urban Act Academy. So this Wednesday, we were able to hand deliver a check for $10,000 and Chick-fil-A to the people of Urban Act, to the teachers of Urban Act Academy. And so Christian chicken is the way to go at Christmas. And so, uh, so yeah, so we're, we're able to, to bless 65 teachers and administrators. We were able to hand deliver a $10,000 check. I got text messages on Friday uh, from the school, from the principal, from, the, from Nigina, the headmaster, saying what a blessing you guys are. And, and that's what generosity does. It plants seeds of hope in the lives of other people that you may not even meet on this side of heaven. That's what Najina said. She's like, you have no idea the, uh, the joy and the hope that you've brought to our staff, many of which you won't even meet. And that's what generosity does. And so I can't encourage you enough to pray about how you can be involved in Give Hope. Let's pray and then we'll uh, dive in the message. God, thanks so much uh, just for your pursuit of us that you did give. And you gave not just uh, leftovers and not just uh, second class stuff. You gave the best. You gave Jesus. You gave your son to take our place and to be something that we could never be, to make us right with you. And so we come to you today out of gratitude and say, open our hearts. Let us receive your word today. Let us be different because we encountered your spirit today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, have you guys ever had something in your life that you romanticize how it's going to go and then it does not go that way? That basically is the story of my life, all right? I, 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 I tend to do it, especially at Christmas and especially with Christmas gifts. It's not as bad now as it was when my kids were little. When my kids were little, I had all kinds of dreams and visions of how much they would love the gifts that I got them. And really, I realized that I was just buying them for myself and hoping that they loved them. And so I, I overestimated their dexterity when it came to video games. And I overestimated their, you know, their uh, brain size when it came to understanding complex board games. I, and, and so it was Christmas 2006, um, we were done Christmas shopping, and I, but it just didn't feel epic enough. And so like, we're, you know, we had hit our budget. We were, we were good to go. Trish had most of the presents wrapped. Like we were, there was low level stress in the house. And I'm like, you know, it's a good Christmas. It doesn't feel like the best Christmas ever. And so I think we need something else. Trish's like, no, they're fine. Like they're 10 six and four. Like they're, 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 gonna, they're good, right? They're, they're fine. I'm like, no, we need something that will send it over the top. Something that would just be like, wow, you really love us, right? And, um, and so I'm like, what about a ping pong table? She's like, what? Why, why a ping pong table? I'm like, well, rich people had ping pong tables when I was growing up, right? Like everybody that was rich, everybody that I wanted to be like, they had a ping pong table at their house. I just equated a ping pong table with rich people. And so I thought we needed a ping pong table. She's like, you know, ping pong table is like $170, right? Like that's not necessarily rich person. I'm like, staff me, woman, all right? And, and so she's like, you know, you might be thinking to yourself, did your kids express an interest in ping pong? 
No. Did your kids ever say that they wanted to play ping pong? Not that I can recall. Did your kids like ever say, dad, you know what? I want to grow up and be a ping pong world champion someday. No, they never expressed that at all. Did my kids at that point at 10, 6, and 4, had they ever even played ping pong? Not to my knowledge, but I felt like that would take this Christmas over the top. And so I go to Dick's, I buy the ping pong table, and I buy it, and then I can't put it together. So I have my neighbor come over, and I have him help me put it together. And Trish is like, here's how this is going to work. The kids, the kids are going to open their gifts, and they're going to be really excited. They're going to be really, they're really, really, really impressed. They're going to be over the moon. And then they're going to go downstairs in the basement. They're going to sing the ping pong table. They're going to try to play it. They're going to argue with each other. They're going to slam the new paddles on the brand new ping pong table that you just bought. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to take the paddles away. They're going to argue. You're going to argue. You're going to yell. And they're never going to play ping pong again. Now, I'm not saying that's exactly how it went, but that's how it went. All right. That's kind of how it went. We sold it like two years later on Craigslist. All right. That That was the end of the ping pong table. But so often in our life, right, there's this gap between how we think our life is going to go, how we think a relationship is going to go, how we think a new job is going to go. There's this gap between how we think it's going to go and how it really goes. There's this gap between the quality that we think our marriage is going to have after five years and our actual marriage after five years. There's this gap between how we think this friendship is going to evolve and how this friendship really is. There's this gap between the joy that we have in our career, and how we really experience our career. And so often in our life, this gap is there between how we think it's going to be and how it actually turns out. We start with this vision of what our life should look like or could look like, and then we get tripped up by how it actually is. Because life happens, and it doesn't play out how we think it's going to be, how it's going to play out, right? And and you get the ping pong table, and you're like, huh, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. It didn't bring me the happiness I thought it was going to bring me. I, I didn't really have the quality experience I thought I was going to have. I didn't really have the fulfillment that I thought it was going to bring me. And this gap between our vision and reality, it creates, this, it creates these cracks. It creates these wounds. And it creates these fractures in our soul. And it's so easy at times, especially at Christmas, I don't know why, but especially at Christmas to focus on the gaps in our life rather than the blessings in our life how we thought things should be compared to how they actually are. And what happens when we do that is we begin to question God, and we begin to question God's ability to use messed up, broken, damaged people. And it's easy to lose hope in that gap, right? And it's easy to lose joy, as we talked about last week in that gap. And it's easy to lose peace in that gap. That's what we're going to talk about today. How can we rediscover peace? Our our theme for this series has been this verse out of Romans chapter 15. It says this, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So God has this desire, the God of hope, part of God's essence, part of God's character, part of God's makeup is hope. Part of who God is, is how things should and could be. It's this perfected vision of reality. That's what God longs to infuse into our life. And as he brings you hope, you know what he also infuses you with? He gives you joy and he gives us peace. But many of us, if we try to describe our life these days, we would not say peaceful in the top three characteristics of our life. Peace would not be how we describe our marriage. Peace would not be how we describe our career. Peace would probably not be how we describe relationship with our in-laws, right? That's not peaceful. The word peace, is, it's very complex, but it's super simple. It's this Hebrew word in the Old Testament called shalom, and it's a word that Jewish people still use to this day. It's, it's, a, it's a word that they use to greet one another, and it's, it's a, as, as you see someone, and it's a word that you use to bless someone as they leave. But beyond that, it carries this deep rooted meaning in the character and the makeup of God. That God is Jehovah Shalom. He's the God of peace. That was, the, that was what the Jewish people banked on that God would usher in peace into their existence, usher in peace into their relationships, usher in peace into their livelihood. 180 times in the Old Testament, the word shalom is used. So the, the essence, the, the under kind of the the, the fabric of the Old Testament is this idea of shalom, this idea of perfect peace that God longs for us to live with. I did a word study on the word shalom this week, and there's so many different rich words that describe it. It means completeness, wholeness, health, welfare, safety, soundness, tranquility, prosperity, perfectness, fullness, 
rest, harmony, the absence of agitation. How is that possible at Target, right? Like the absence of agitation, the absence of discord. And here's, here's what's so ironic. One of the promises of Christmas is peace. One of the first things that happens after the birth of Jesus is all these angels appear to shepherds, which had never been seen or experienced in human history. These angels appear to shepherds, and what do they say? We're going to bring peace to all men. We're going to bring shalom. The birth of Jesus is going to usher in peace to everyone. The Bible promises those that follow Jesus to give us a peace that surpasses all understanding, a shalom that surpasses anything that you can comprehend. There's a place in the New Testament that lists out the characteristics of those of us that follow Jesus. It's called the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy. The third one, peace. Like a character quality of someone who is a follower of Jesus should be love, which is hard to find in 2021. It should be joy, which we talked about last week, is elusive. And the third character quality of someone who says they follow the Prince of Peace is actually peace. It's this idea of of completeness, of wholeness. Jesus himself was called the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Shalom, the Prince of Wholeness, the Prince of Completeness, the Prince of Perfection, the Prince of Safety, the Prince of Welfare, the Prince of Fullness, the Prince of Rest. How can you and I be in a relationship with the Prince of Rest and be so tired? How's that possible? So so what type of peace are we talking about? We're not talking about the absence of war. That's military peace. We're not talking about um, the, the absence of, we're not talking about relational harmony. That's relational peace. What I want to talk to you today about is spiritual peace, like a condition of your heart, a condition of your soul. It's, it's, it's how you live your life. It's not, it's not based on your circumstances and it's not an emotion. It's not something that you can feel your way into. It's a, it's a, fruit of the Spirit that the Holy Spirit gives you. What, what does the Roman, writer of Romans say? He says it there. He says, I'm, gonna, I'm going to give you hope, joy, and peace by the power of the Holy Spirit. So as, you're, as you grow in a relationship with God, the overflow, the evidence of that growth in your relationship with God should be a life of peace. So just for a working definition for our time together, I took kind of those words and kind of narrowed it down to this statement. Definition of peace is unbroken well-being and contentment. Unbroken well-being. In a world that is so fractured, unbroken well-being. In a world that's so discontent, contentment. That's what peace is. Look at what Isaiah says. This is talking about the coming of Christ. It says, and this righteousness, this righteousness Jesus, will bring peace. Like that was one of the purposes of Jesus coming to earth was to usher in shalom, was to bring us this character quality of peace. He says, it will bring quietness and confidence forever. So peace is this quietness of heart and this confidence in God. It's wholeness in the midst of brokenness. It's well-being in the midst of hurt. It's contentment in the midst of unrest. Now, there is going to be a gap between how you think your life is going to go and how it actually goes. No matter how good your life is right now, no matter how good your relationships are right now, no matter how good your finances are right now, there is going to be a season of life either that you are coming into or going out of where you're going to experience letdown. You're going to experience disappointment. You're going to experience this unfulfillment of, man, I thought it was going to go this way, and it didn't. Relationships will break down. Marriages are going to fail. Jobs will be lost. Loved ones will pass away. Failure is going to happen. Mistakes are going to be made. But peace is the God-given ability to experience unbroken well-being and contentment in the middle of all of that, in the midst of all that. It's this idea of you being well and content regardless of your circumstances. How amazing is that? Look what Jesus himself says about peace in John 14. He says, peace I leave you, I leave with you. My shalom, my well-being, my perfection, my harmony, my rest I give you. He says, I don't give as the world gives. 
right? He, he said, hey, this isn't circumstantial. This isn't temporal. We're, we're not talking about a, an emotion that you're trying to catch. We're not trying, talking about something that you're trying to acquire. I want to give it to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to infuse my peace in you. And it's different than anything you could ever experience in the world. Your, your job isn't going to provide it. Your spouse isn't going to provide it. Your circumstances aren't going to provide it. No matter how much you acquire, it's not going to bring it. I'm going to give it to you. See, peace, or the absence of peace, he says, is a troubled heart and a fearful mind. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid. So I'm going to give you my peace. But if you're not living with peace, here's what you're going to experience. You're going to experience a fearful mind and you're going to experience a troubled heart. I wonder for for how many of you today, if you were just being straight up honest with yourself and with God, you would say, that describes my life a fearful mind and a troubled heart. A fearful mind, all kinds of COVID stuff. A troubled heart, all kinds of unrest politically, all kinds of unrest racially. Right? Like like we can be inundated with all these things that bring fear to our minds and troubles to our heart. Jesus says, hey, that is the absence of peace. That is not what I want you to experience. See, anxiety and peace can't occupy the same heart. Now, some of us struggle with anxiety that's a chemical I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about a a chemical imbalance that brings you anxiety. I'm I'm talking about the emotion of anxiety, the the idea of worry, right? Like if when we choose, when when we feel worry, worry and anxiety cannot occupy the same heart as peace. They're opposed to one another. See, when there's a presence of peace, there's an absence of anxiety. A troubled heart overtakes a quiet heart. And the presence of fear erodes confidence in God. So, In Matthew, um, which is a Christmas story, Joseph finds himself in the middle of this gap between how he thought his life was going to be and how it actually is. He he has rehearsed this moment his entire life. He's prepared for this moment his entire life. He's been excited about this moment. He is committed, he has promised to be married to someone. And it's supposed to be the happiest moment of his life. And then two words change everything and begin to rip apart the peace that he is feeling. And those words are, I'm pregnant. And everything changes. His world is completely turned upside down. And his peace, his shalom, is at risk. So what I want to do is I want to look at this passage of Scripture in the Christmas story, and then I want to draw out some roadblocks to peace that you and I can experience and how we can identify those. Matthew chapter 1, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus, because he will save people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she had given birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. So we, we have the we have the ability to look back on a 2,000-year-old event. And for many of us, these people are characters in a story. They're figurines on a table at home. They're they're not necessarily real people working out a real relationship with God, but that's exactly who they were. They, They didn't have the benefit of seeing how the story is going to play out. They're going through tragedy and heartache and disruption in real time. And Joseph has a very important decision to make. And so some of the roadblocks that he experiences in, the, in, in this um, season of his life is the first one is unmet expectations. He says Mary was, was pledged to be married to Joseph. There was this engagement. Now, you get a sense of the importance of engagement in this culture by the very next sentence. It says he was pledged to be married, but then it says Joseph, her husband. So in this culture... The engagement was the deal. 
all right? And it wasn't just the Instagram post, all right? And it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just the gender reveal party, all right? It was a huge ceremony, and it was the exchange of money and gifts between families, and it was a, like a seven-day party, not, for the, not just for the wedding, for the engagement. And likely, Joseph and Mary's engagement had been worked out over years of time, right? Their, their families probably knew each other. Right? He had expectations going into this relationship. There was this expectancy that what she promised to be was faithful to him. She, he was pledged to her. There was, it, was not just a, it wasn't just a verbal promise. It was a civil contract. It was, it was a contract that was, that was signed by both families. He had expectations. He had a vision for his marriage. He expected his fiance to be faithful, to keep her promise. He expected not to be cheated on. He expected her to tell the truth. He expected to marry a virgin. He expected to celebrate with his family and community at this huge wedding banquet. He expected not to be embarrassed and humiliated in front of all of his friends and family. And she says, I'm pregnant. And her explanation, it's the Holy Spirit. What? Right? Like, like we read that and we're like, oh, yeah, it's the Holy Spirit. That's the ah, Virgin Mary, right? That's whack, you guys. All right, that's just unbelievable. And, and she, that's what she's selling. That's what she's trying to say. Joseph, I, have, I, I haven't cheated on you. It's from the Lord. Right? You talk about unmet expectations. How, how do you find peace when your expectations aren't met? Because maybe you expect to be married by now. You expect it to be a parent by now. You expected to be promoted at work by now. You expected your marriage to be healthy by now. You expected to be healthy by now. You expected to be over your divorce by now. You expected God to answer your prayers by now. Here's here's what I've learned in my relationship with God. In order to find hope, I have to admit my despair. In order to find joy, I have to be honest about my disappointment. In order to find peace, I have to come to terms with the unmet expectations in my life. And in real time, I'm in a season, we're in a season in our life as a couple, 26 years into marriage, and there are some real unmet expectations, not in our relationship, but in our life right now that we're wrestling with, that we're talking about, that that we're coming to terms with. In our relationship with God, we're taking to God these unmet unmet expectations and going, really God? At this point in our life, really, this is how this is playing out? And ignoring those things will never bring you peace. Not acknowledging your unmet expectations is never going to allow God to meet you where you are. Right? God only heals the parts of our heart that we bring to him. Right? And so pretending that you don't have peace or pretending that you have peace is not going to bring you peace. Being honest about not having peace is the first step to experiencing peace. Now, the second roadblock that he experiences is unfair expectation or unfair circumstances. That's exactly where Joseph finds himself in the Christmas story. Look at verse 19. Because Joseph, her husband, okay, that's the, that's the word there that eludes that, that connects the engagement is as important as the marriage, was faithful to the law. Joseph was the faithful one. He did everything right. He trusted God. He obeyed. He didn't do anything to deserve this public embarrassment. He didn't do anything to deserve a wife that would would cheat on him. Her best explanation was, this is from the Lord, it's a blessing. The whole thing was unfair. Her explanation was unfair. The circumstances were unfair. God was unfair. Many of you guys were around this summer when Trish shared some really unfair circumstances that has begun to shape our life. In the span of seven days, I found out that the person who I thought was my birth father for the last 12 years is not. I found out on Ancestry.com. Within a span of five or six days later, Trish finds out that the dad that she grew up with is not her dad at all. And he didn't know that either. She shared that news with him over the phone as she read a paternity test. And you talk about unfair circumstances. You talk about devastation. I've not heard cries like that from the person that I love the most in my life. Anguish, 
heartache, devastation, disbelief, all wrapped up in the moans and the cries that come from the depth of your soul. If you've lost someone or something that is so central to who you are, you, you get it. You know what I'm talking about. And so this Christmas is more complex than we ever thought it could be. We were just talking a few days ago about the levels of grief and the layers of hurt that have been processed and that have yet to be processed. But the prevailing emotion that we both felt is, this isn't fair. This isn't what we thought our life would look like. This isn't what we want to deal with this Christmas. And what happens when you get in this place where you're experiencing unfair circumstances? You don't look at the circumstances unfair. Who do you look at as unfair? God. You think because I'm a pastor, I don't think God's unfair? You think because we're pastors we haven't felt God? What are you doing to us? No, that's a natural emotion. But it's that response that it doesn't give you more peace. It, it erodes more peace. Now, you have to acknowledge it. Acknowledging it is important. Living there is dangerous. So our world in so many ways is still so shattered. So how can you find peace? Maybe that's where you are this Christmas. I wish I had a little, nice little bow to wrap on that story. It's still in real time. Just like Joseph's story was in real time. He had no way of knowing the eternal implications of his choices in this moment. And neither do you. Maybe this Christmas you find yourself a victim of unfair circumstances. You were the faithful spouse. You were the loving husband. You were the generous person that got taken advantage of by a family member. You were the health nut that got blindsided by a diagnosis. You were the loyal friend. You were the dedicated employee that got passed over or let go. You were the forgiving sister. You paid every bill on time until all those medical bills sunk you financially. You didn't do anything to deserve the circumstances that you're in right now. See, when you're faithful to God and you find yourself in a situation in which it feels like he hasn't been faithful to you, the first thing that you lose is confidence in the goodness of God. And it's easy to allow peace to evaporate. It's easy to trade wholeness and contentment for troubled hearts and fearful minds. The last roadblock that Joseph experiences is unresolved conflict. Unresolved conflict. You know, Joseph had this anticipation of his marriage and his family and his carpentry business and how he was going to grow it and how he was going to establish a new family and a future. And then he experiences this complete despair with news that his fiance is unfaithful. Now, it gets to a place where Many of your relationships have may, maybe have gotten, and that's a place of resignation, where it's easy to give up on the relationship than it is to fight for it, right? Like you give and you give and you give, and what you think you deserve in return isn't reciprocated, and so rather than continue to give, you say, I'm just done. I don't have anything more to give. And so he goes into this place of resignation, and he decides to quit. He's going to divorce her quietly, which is actually an act of grace. In this culture... Women, men weren't held to this standard, but women who were caught in adultery were subject to execution. It would have been brought out in front of the entire town, in this case, Bethlehem, and they would have been surrounded by the elders of the community, and they would have been stoned to death. They would have thrown rocks at Mary until she died. That's what Joseph was entitled to, a public execution of his cheating wife. And so him deciding to divorce her quietly saved her life and him embarrassment. But that's his path. That's what he's going to do. And then he goes to bed that night. And that, that's his plan. Have you ever been there in a relationship? Ever been in a place where you feel like it's easier to give up on that relationship than it is to fight for it? Maybe unresolved conflict is keeping peace at bay for you this Christmas. And you are so dreading Friday or you're so dreading Saturday or Sunday whenever you are going to visit that person where unrest and resignation just lives in your relationship. You thought that ignoring conflict would make it go away, but time does not heal all wounds, 
right? An absence doesn't make the heart grow fonder. It makes the heart grow bitter. We can pretend things are okay when we go home for Christmas, and we can pretend things are okay with our ex-spouse when we really haven't forgiven them, and we can pretend and act like we don't have issues with our sister or our dad, but pretending you have peace will not bring you peace. See, peace isn't the absence of conflict. It's the presence of God bringing wholeness despite conflict. Peace isn't the absence of tragedy. It's God given wholeness in the midst of your tragedy. Peace isn't the absence of unfair circumstances. It is God given wholeness in the midst of those circumstances. And peace isn't the absence of heartache or disappointment. It's God given wholeness and contentment in the midst of your heartache and disappointment. That's why it surpasses all understanding, because it doesn't make sense. And so Joseph decides, you know what? I'm filing for divorce. He goes to bed that night, the angel of the Lord appears to Joseph, and he reassures him that Mary is indeed telling the truth. The baby is from God, and you're going to be the earthly father of the Messiah. He's going to save humanity from their sins. Now, <laughs> if I'm Joseph, I just eat some bad pizza. Maybe I had leavened bread instead of unleavened bread last night. Like, what, you know, what, what's going on here? Like, but for whatever reason, he takes this dream as gospel, literally. Like he believes it. He knows it's from God. The Holy Spirit communicates with his heart and soul in such a way that he completely changes position. Look what it says in Matthew 124. It says, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him. And he took Mary home as his wife. Here's what I've learned in my life. The peace that you long for, the peace that I long for, it's more a result of our obedience than it is our circumstances. Joseph did what the angel of the Lord commanded him. So if you feel like peace is elusive and you can't find it this Christmas, do what the Lord commands. Right feelings will follow right actions. Do what God commands in your marriage. Do what God commands in your finances. Do what God commands in your dating life. Do what God commands in a broken relationship. I heard a pastor say years ago that if you feel like you're wandering in the desert for 40 years, the worst thing you can do is sin in the desert because it just delays the promised land even longer. And so if you feel like peace is absent in your life right now, the best thing you can do is the next best thing. Just to do what the Lord commands. And I'm so proud of my wife. She isn't perfect and she isn't over all that's happened. But over and over again, she's chosen to show up. And she's chosen to be obedient despite her circumstances. This isn't in my notes, but it's peace that is allowing her to stand on a stage today and lead you into the presence of God. That's peace. This is passes all understanding. Peace isn't an emotion you can chase down, you can acquire. It's a condition of your soul that God wants to give you through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so when there's a gap between how you thought your life was going to go and how it's actually going, the pathway to peace may be your willingness to be obedient, to get up and to do what the Lord commands. That may be the pathway. Choosing to do what's right, even when it's hard. And so do you need peace this Christmas? Why don't you bring all of your unmet expectations to the Prince of Peace, to the Prince of Shalom? You feel like you're in unfair circumstances right now that you don't deserve, that God's not fair? Why don't you bring that? to the Prince of Peace. Do you feel like there's unresolved conflict in your life right now? Why don't you offer that to the Prince of Peace? And the peace of God will guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. See, you're not just offered peace, you're offered the Prince of Peace to walk through, to walk with you through unpeaceful situations. That's God's offer for all of us today. Let's pray. Uh, 
Uh, God, we uh, come to you today just acknowledging um, that our, our world is not perfect. And there are forces that try to rob us of peace, try to rob us of wholeness. There are fractures and wounds that we accumulate in almost every relationship that we're in. Some of us have been fractured and wounded by the church. Some of us have been fractured and wounded by spiritual leaders. Some of us have been fractured and wounded by a spouse, the person that we loved and trusted the most. Some of us have, are sitting here right now and we're so distant from our adult kids, people that we raised and loved and would do anything for, and they don't have the time of day for us, and it's robbing us of peace. Some of us thought that this new job was going to bring us peace, and all it's brought is a stress. Some of us thought that being married would bring us peace, and it's brought a sense of loneliness and despair that we never knew was possible. We're confused, and we're distraught, and we just want to give up. Would you bring your peace through the power of the Holy Spirit, infuse hope and joy and peace into our life and allow us to walk every day from now all the way through Christmas with the Prince of Peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Church, would you stand to your feet? We're going to respond with this song. And I just want to invite you to let these words wash over you as you learn this simple melody.
everlasting. And that your word has told us that you have given peace that was given to us not as the world gives. It's a peace that can't be taken away. And so God, I just ask that you'd help us to stand in that and that you'd help us to just remember the importance and um, the peace that comes with obeying you and putting our full trust in the fact that you are fully capable at being God. And so the pressure is off of us to feel like we have everything figured out. We can just trust you and walk by faith. And so we love you, Jesus. And as Christmas approaches, we ask that you'd help us to keep the true meaning of Christmas close to heart and mind, that we remember who you are, why you came, and what you've done for us. So it's in the mighty name of Jesus that I pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hope City, we love you guys. We're so excited to celebrate Christmas with you. Um, we would love to see you at one of our three services, 23rd at 630 or the 24th at 4 o'clock or 530. We love you guys. Have an awesome rest of your week.